Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Hansel, Editor-in-Chief of NAEYC's peer-reviewed journal, Young Children. I'd like to start by thanking all of the early childhood educators who have joined us for this webinar. We know that you are busy professionals, and we deeply appreciate that you have chosen to spend some time with us. I am truly excited to share that we have over 2,000 people signed up to deepen their knowledge of play-based learning this afternoon. I believe there's been such an overwhelming response to this webinar for two reasons. First, play is essential to learning for young children. Play supports the development of language, self-control, social skills, mathematics, and more. Second, we are fortunate to have two excellent presenters. Kathy hirsch pasick a psychology professor at Temple University, will explain why play is critical to development and why guided play is especially effective for extending children's learning. Then, Shana Cook, a policy analyst with New America, will discuss helping decision makers better understand the value of play. After the presentations, we will have time for questions. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping details. If you have questions you want to ask the presenters, please write them in the question box on the lower left side of your screen. The authors will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations. Some people using a telephone line may experience a slight delay. You will have the best experience using the sound on your computer. Now let's dive in. Uh, we'd like to start with getting to know the audience. A question should appear on your screen asking how many minutes per day your children engage in free and or guided play. We'll give you just a few seconds to answer, and then we'll share the results. Great. All right, looks like we've got a lot of participants here, so we're going to send the results out to you now. Okay. Well, it is great to see that most children do have a decent amount of time to play. Um, so now, seeing that we have 60 plus minutes, that's good, but we, we could definitely do a little bit better. Um, particularly, you know, we've got a, a decent number of answers there under an hour per day. So let's turn it over to Kathy hirsch pasick to find out how best to use the time that we do have and perhaps be inspired to increase the amount of time allocated to free and guided play. Kathy, over to you. All right, thanks, Linda. It is so great to be here. So today, I really want to encourage us all to think about the learning value of play. And that's going to be a surprise to a lot of people that I put play and learning in the same breath, in the same clause. But I'm going to talk to us today about playful learning from theory to practice. Now, we start by just asking, what do we know throughout the psychological literature? And what we know is that in the science of learning, humans are said to learn best when they are active rather than passive, when they are engaged rather than distracted, when the information they're hearing is meaningful rather than disembodied and boring, and when they are socially interactive because kids do like to play with other kids. And amazingly, these four features come together in playful learning. I was actually quite excited to yesterday read the new Duke report where they talk about what works in preschool. And believe it or not, it's about being actively engaged and joyful and doing something that's meaningful. These same characteristics come up time and time again and they coalesce in playful learning. Now, playful learning, on my definition, contains both free play and what I call guided play. And free play, whether it's with objects or fantasy or make-believe or it's physical like rough and tumble play, has a definition that has been used in our literature. First and most importantly, it's pleasurable and it's enjoyable. It has no extrinsic goals. It's spontaneous. It's active and all engrossing, seems to sometimes have a private reality as non-linear, linear, and can also be make-believe, which is what a lot of three and four and five-year-olds do so well. Guided play, on the other hand, is defined in a different way. 
guided play happens when we plan out our classrooms so that it's enriched with objects and toys that are likely to get our kids to learn just by virtue of their playing with them, like blocks or origami or when they're playing with puzzles. It also happens when, as adults, we enhance children's exploration and learning by playing with children, by saying, what do you think is going to come next? Not those closed questions, is it blue, is it green, but what color do you think it is? Or suggesting ways to explore materials that children might not even think of. What would you like to do with a pipe cleaner? Let's experiment. That's a big word. And see what we can make with that pipe cleaner. Now, we see guided play environments all over. When we go to museums, for example, we're in a guided play environment that's been very, very well thought out. Most of our classrooms are guided play environments. We kind of know what we want our kids to get out of those classrooms. Or if you take some of the toys like the Montessori toys, they too would fall under our definition of guided play. Now, I've conceptualized the different kinds of play in this way. You can have play that is initiated by a child or an adult, and you can have play that is directed by the child or adult within that space. So let's look at that for a moment. When I create a children's museum exhibit, that's initiated by an adult, but the child can direct everything within that environment, and I would call that guided play. When it's initiated by a child, the child builds the fort out of the couch and then directed by the child, we call that free play. When it's initiated by the child, oh, I really want to draw something, and then an adult comes along and said, oh, are you drawing an airplane? Let me help. That's co-opted play. And then, of course, there's initiated by an adult and directed by an adult. Even if we try to dress it up and play clothes, it's still direct instruction or what Jacob Hapgood once called chocolate-covered broccoli. Underneath that chocolate, it's still broccoli. Now, I was in Taipei this past year, and I also saw some beautiful examples that I have illustrated for you here. They just have the kids come around in this indoor playground, and you can see in one, they're like a Rosie Revere engineer. They get to pick out the items and build and build to their heart's content on the left. And on the right, they become the managers of the nearest corner store. And they can sell us the foods and even weigh the foods and have a cash register with which to learn math. See the learning as you look at these two examples. Now, research from our laboratory and others finds that playful learning, and particularly guided play, can advance young children's skills in language, reading, math, spatial learning, or STEM, executive function, and social emotionally. It also suggests that playful learning might just prove an optimal teaching pedagogy in high-quality schools for our youngest children. So I wanted to give you several examples that make my point and show you just a little bit of the research. Let's go first to language and literacy. In language and literacy, the goal of our one experiment that was funded from the Department of Education was to increase vocabulary for low-income children as they read a book, and then to play to reinforce the words that they learned. Some of the kids, after we read The Knight and the Dragon, were going to engage in a free play activity where they were going to have knight figurines and dragon figurines, and they could play any way that they wanted to. The other two kinds of play we had more adult involvement, guided play and directed play, where we actually helped set up the scene where the dragon was threatening the entire community. And what were they going to do next? And there we could drop in the vocabulary that we used in the book. What did we find? We found that guided and directed, but not free play, actually made a difference for word learning, a slight difference but a dif difference nonetheless. In a second study that we did, we wanted to know if a board game could actually be used to increase vocabulary skills. And we did a pre- and a post-test of the intervention. One was with absolute flashcards. They were fun, but they weren't quite playing the game. And in each, we introduced 
new words like galloping below, intelligent charging. Can you hear all the knights and dragon words coming out right here, even the dragon's nostrils? And what we found is that when we did the intervention against a control group that didn't have the intervention, we found that young kids learned more when we played games using those words than they did when we weren't playing the games. Now, we've also found that it's not just in language and literacy. The guided play also works for research in early STEM skills. And believe it or not, that block corner that you have in your classrooms and play with puzzles can make all the difference. In fact, it helps children learn the spatial skills that are going to predict mathematical ability at school entrance. That is, if I test a young child's spatial ability at age three, Using blocks and puzzles, I can actually predict what their early math scores are going to be two years later when they enter into school. Now, it turns out that this guided play also works for social-emotional control, or what you often hear of as executive function skills, attention, memory, and planning. These are the learning-to-learn -learn skills, which later relate out to reading and math competency, as well as children's problem-solving ability, ability when they encounter something new. A very good example of that is the Tools of the Mind program, where children play specified games throughout the school day. Guided play also works in teaching kids causal learning. Well, it turns out that three-year-olds can actually free, free play in how to start a circular machine with either a blue circle or a green circle. Notice that in the circular machine, they have green and circle. Can the kid with a series of blocks figure out how to turn on the machine here with a circle? And could they do it with another machine when they see something familiar like a blue rectangle? Do they know they should use a shape match and not a color match? The answer is yes. And the answer is that they can learn how to turn on that machine by just playing with various machines. 19-month-olds required a little bit of guided play. The three-year-olds actually did it if you just had the right materials in that environment. And finally, I wanted to share with you some beautiful results from Bonowitz, Shafto, Guan, Goodman, Spelke, and Schultz. I love this experiment. They had a toy, and the toy has three features, actually four features. It has a light button, and if you twist something in a certain way, a light goes on, and a squeaker, if you pull out the tube, it squeaks, and a mirror that you could look in, and music that happened if you pressed a button. And in one case, I can give the kids the opportunity to merely play with the toy and see what they discover. And in the other, I say, hey, look, hey, look, if you pull out this part of the tube, it squeaks, and then I hand it to the kids and let them play. It turns out that the young children who were taught to pull out the tube and get the squeaker, they kept pulling out the tube and getting the squeaker. But they never found the three other functions that the toy could do. Those kids who were playing, they were the explorers and discoverers. And they found all four of the toys function. Indeed, research suggests then that the play helps causal reasoning because it helps young children become scientists. It helps them form their own hypotheses and to test them. Alison Gopnik once said, that's why preschoolers often outsmart college students in figuring out gadgets. And I know in my house, that was true, too. So taken together, this work demonstrates the potential reach of playful learning and of guided play as a model for learning. But we might ask why. Well, in part, I already told you the answer. Because when children are playing, they are active, they are engaged, they are doing something that is meaningful to them, and often, though not always, they are in a social environment. They are the agents of their own actions in environments that we construct to help them learn. And as a special add-on, 
because play is so enjoyable, it also captures young children's imaginations and their attention. So we might ask, can we create playful learning environments at home and school and in the community? I, I think we can. And in fact, in our world, we're doing just that. I thought I'd just share with you a few examples of how we're transforming everyday spaces into smart zones that promote playful learning. Example one is we wanted to see if we could reimagine a park and create it as a learning opportunity. We did this with what we called the ultimate block party by taking over Central Park in New York. There's our block party insignia. We had 28 science-vetted activities where parents could see how learning goes on through play, how to change the lens. And you can actually do that in your own schools at Parents' Night by showing parents how play, how putting water in cups and pouring them into bigger cups can help young children and indeed them learn about measurement. Here you can see that we got over 60,000 people who came to the park that day to partake in the world's largest Simon Says. That's executive function skills and impulse control. They learned spatial learning through a Lego exhibit. And we had some of the leading scientists come and help us write the ultimate block party playbook. Our research and evaluation showed that it was a transformative experience for everyone who was there, and that the adults actually came to understand and see just how playful learning led to the kind of learning they wanted for their own children. In example two, we went into supermarkets, and in collaboration with the Fresh Grocer in a low-income area of Philadelphia, we decided to put up signs. We put up signs like, did you know? that there's learning in those grocery store aisles. And sometimes we had that silly little cow and he just said, hey, I deliver milk. These products come from milk. Can you find other stuff that comes from milk? And we watched as people with their children would go looking for cottage cheese and cream cheese and yogurt. And when the signs were up, we got 33% more language between children and their parents than we did when the signs were down. In a third case, one that we're doing now, we're dreaming and we're reimagining cities through what we call urban thinkscapes. We're asking, what if? What if you took everyday cityscapes and they became opportunities for playful learning? Watch as we transform a bus stop and your everyday streetlight. Here on your left, you see the turning puzzle bench. At every bunch, we are going to put in a dowel rod system with puzzles so the children who don't have the opportunity to play with those puzzles get them at the bus stop while they're waiting. And the scale bench, more people on that area of the bench, the lower down it goes. And look what we can do with a street light. Look at the one on the right in particular with the upside down umbrella. You see that one child turning the dial and as he does, the umbrella at the top rotates, and you get an animated movie-like picture on the street below. We can create smart zones from playful learning environments and have them each informed by the science of learning. Think waiting rooms. Think barber shops, Think nail salons. Think playgrounds. And we're starting to do that even with live-size board games. This is what we call Parkopoly, and it's just under construction right now. Here's the street view. But what I want you to notice is that as you go down the blocks, you actually can see hatchet marks even in the first tile because we want the kids and the adults to talk about fractions. Yes, in this particular game, you can move half spaces and whole spaces. And here's a close-up of the dice. We've reinvented dice so that one dice is what you're used to seeing and one has fractions on it. Imagine getting our kids over the hump of what they'll later face in mathematics by starting them early and seeing fractions. Well, in sum, it's time to reimagine learning through play. I mean, playful learning works. It's one of those prime areas in which families engage in active, 
engaged, meaningful and socially interactive learning, and where we can grow skills both in and out of school so that we can complement what you do in school with what goes on outside of the school walls. In our new book, we actually look behind the science and we explain why playful learning works and reimagine education in and out of school. So in the words of Carla Rinaldi, who's the president of Reggio Children, I quote, it is unclear how play and learning were ever divorced from one another. They are like the wings of a butterfly, one play and one learning. And without both, the butterfly could never take flight. Perhaps it's time not to talk about play and learning, but about learning. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Kathy. That was a fascinating presentation. Um, before we turn to Shana, let's hear from the audience again. You should now see a question on the extent to which your center or school leaders support pre and or guided play. As before, we'll give you just a moment to answer and then share the results. So thank you for uh, weighing in. We're sending the results out to you now. Uh, I think these results show that although there is some support, um, we certainly see there's also room to grow. So let's hear from Shana Cook to find out how we can help decision makers see the true value of play. So Shana, let's uh, take it from here. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I'm very excited to speak with you all today. Um, in 2015, New America's Early and Elementary Education, education Program, led by Laura Bornfund, set out to gain a deeper understanding of how elementary school principals view their role as early education leaders. In conjunction with the FDR group, we held five focus groups across the country in San Francisco, New York City, Austin, Minneapolis, and Orlando, with elementary school principals. We released a total of six briefs on different themes that emerged from our focus groups, including principals' hiring and staffing practices and the need for better preparation in early childhood development for elementary school principals. The brief that I'll be talking about today is called A False Dichotomy, Elementary Principles on Academics and Play. You can find this brief and others at newamerica.org. My colleague Abby Lieberman unfortunately couldn't be here today. We wrote this brief together based on our focus groups and I'll walk you through some of our findings now. So our first finding was that many uh, defined early childhood difference. So we found that principals had a wide range of ideas about what defined early childhood education. Some thought it spanned from birth through age five. Others thought it was pre-K through second grade. The variance in definition is important because principals' views of who is a part of early childhood education colored their perception of when play was appropriate in the classroom. One thing to note is that even principals in the same district had various views of how early childhood education should be defined. And just as a side note, uh, New America and Macy define early childhood as birth through third grade. So the good news is that there were principals who understood the importance of play and advocated for play in their school building or community. As one principal from Minneapolis stated, I think there are benefits of creative play too. The creativity involved with that, the natural problem solving that kids learn to do through play, the socialization through play, there are a lot of things. We lose a little when we take that away at this early age. The principals in our focus groups discussed how play was essential to developing important skills necessary for the later grades. 
Although some elementary school principals understood the importance of play, they felt pressured to limit play in the early years and grades within the school building. As one Orlando principal put it, I have to be honest. We don't have a kitchen or house anymore in kindergarten because there is no time for that. And another Austin principal said, I feel heartache about children not being able to play as much in first grade. There are many reasons why principals feel this way. Many principals attributed this new pressure to the aftermath of No Child Left Behind and the pressure to teach more academic skills earlier on. Some didn't recognize that traditional academic learning could be achieved through play, as Kathy just explained. A Minneapolis principal said, when I was a principal 18 years ago versus now, because of NCLB, No Child Left Behind, demands and expectations of the state were less. Now, there's a pressure for people to drive our kids more, so there is less opportunity for kids to put on a play or do more creative stuff. District leaders also created confusion for principals around whether play is appropriate in classrooms. They often send mixed messages to principals and teachers. In Orlando, a principal said, the county goes out and buys hundreds of worksheets for kindergarten kids, but teachers feel they would get a bad evaluation if they did use them. We are not supposed to use them. Another principal from Austin gave another example of mixed messages, saying, we originally overreacted and took our kitchens out of the kindergarten classes because there wasn't time to play house anymore. But now they're pushing them back in and saying, how do we integrate our centers to hit those academic cues? While still other principals didn't feel they had control over how educational philosophies were carried out in their school's classrooms. A Minneapolis principal said, we don't have much autonomy as principal, but I know as a former early childhood teacher and parent that we are not really doing what is in the best interest of our children in trying to get them to love reading and to become more proficient readers. We are sort of working against these goals. And that leads us to some of our recommendations. In our principal briefs, we lay out a few recommendations for district and state leaders. But community, community members are also key factors uh, in this movement, um, and they can advocate for these recommendations at the local level. We recommend that districts adopt a common definition of early childhood education that aligns with NACI, spanning from birth through grade three, so that play is valued both in the early years and in the early grades. This common definition would allow both school leaders and their staff to focus on professional development that is better aligned to the research around how young children learn. We also discuss how principal preparation, particularly for those leading elementary schools, should include learning about ch child development and how learning trajectories can be integrated into guided play. As we say in our NACI blog, this will help principals to become early childhood leaders in their schools. By, framing, or by reforming principal preparation to, become, to better incorporate early learning, states and districts can ensure that principals enter their role understanding how best to serve young children on day one. However, uh, we do recognize that there are many principals already in the field and principals that need continued support. And we can use professional development to help principals uh, to continue to stay up to date on the latest re research on how best to teach young children. Thanks for listening. So that was terrific, Shana. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to turn to audience questions, and I'm glad to see that we have a fair amount of time here because we've gotten lots and lots of questions coming in throughout both presentations. Um, Kathy, I'm going to start with you 
there were several questions conveying a lot of excitement about your community and park-based learning initiatives. Could you talk a little bit more about how this can spread across the United States? Oh, you bet. Thank you so much for asking. I was on the phone all morning about these ideas and how to spread them. So here, here's what we're doing. Um, when a community is interested, uh, what we're first doing is setting up pilot projects to have a kind of proof of concept. So we've already done the ultimate block party in four different cities, in um, New York, Toronto, Norwalk, Connecticut, and Baltimore, Maryland. And it's been really exciting. I mean, it generated a lot of enthusiasm for early childhood educators, for families, for schools, for museums. It was just really cool. And believe it or not, the universities all got involved too, which was, which was really nice. You know, that kind of thing takes a committee and takes some real help uh, to pull off. A paper on the effectiveness of that is actually going to be published in Child Development, and I think uh, it's going to be at least in web presence quite soon. The supermarket study uh, was done in Philadelphia and Delaware. It's published already, so that proof of concept is also out there. There is a huge initiative going on in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma right now, and believe it or not, also in Johannesburg and in uh, Cape Town in South Africa, where it appears to be um, going as planned. Urban Thinkscape, we are just putting the installments together now. We hope to have them up at the end of June, beginning of July for our very first Urban Thinkscape, and that will be in Philadelphia. You can learn more about that by going on to the Brookings Institution website, where uh, if you just type in my name and Brookings, you'll find a series of webcasts, uh, not webcasts, I'm sorry, of blog entries that actually uh, describe in a little more detail how we're thinking of turning the cityscapes into learningscapes. And Parkopoly is just under design now, and we're, we've just found, we think, some funding to try to get the proof of concept up. So our thought for the future is that we actually want to package these things in a way that allows everyone to have almost open source opportunities to put these together and to begin to build learning communities in their town. We hope to scale it up, to disseminate it to all of you, to give kind of the rules behind how you do it, and then to, uh, to watch it spread so that every city can become a learning city. Okay, that is great. Thank you so much. And we're only getting um, even more and more comments <laughs> uh, being posted here from participants, including um, the most recent one, a specific plea to bring this to Chicago. So um, we'll let you think about that. And I want to turn to Shana here. Um, Shana, I'm going to combine a couple of questions just because we have so many. Um, but one is along the lines of having you talk a little bit more about how learning trajectories can be built into guided play. And the subtext here seems to be related to um, particularly first, second, third grades and um, the many different academic standards that need to be met. And I thought maybe you could combine that with talking a little bit about how districts and states are approaching the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and you know, so we have standards and accountability sort of married together here, all in the interest of those learning trajectories. That sounds like a lot. How does guided play help us meet our goals? Well, first, I'll um, just link back to Kathy's presentation where she uh, described how um, different uh, skills uh, and content areas like uh, STEM learning could be developed through play. And so that's, kind of, that's, that's what it, um, we meant by that, um, using uh, the research base for how these learning trajectories um, how these learning trajectories are developed and incorporating them into the classroom through play. And then in terms of every, the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, now that um, um, it's been passed, uh, there's greater, and states are currently, um, they've are, they either already have submitted plans or are planning on um, submitting plans this summer. 
uh, this uh, new uh, policy uh, framework for uh, elementary and secondary education allows uh, states to have more flexibility when it comes to how they're evaluating different schools. Uh, and so they'll be evaluating schools on different measures and not solely on testing. And so this opens up um, some opportunities to adopt uh, new policies and practices that will be in the best interest of children because it will relieve some of the pressure that schools once had um, to uh, focus on just the accountability standard of testing. Okay, great. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm going to continue combining questions here just to get through um, as many as possible. So, Kathy, back to you. Um, we have a few questions related to block play. You had mentioned um, it predicting math and science achievement, and we have um, several different questions are sort of revolving around better understanding the benefits of block play and, I guess, how to maximize those benefits. And then in the interest of time, I'm going to toss out a couple more that maybe you can also tack on, which we had one related to um, saying a little bit more about building vocabulary through play and along those same lines, um, specifically how you can support the learning of dual language learners through play. So that's an awful lot for you to tackle in a short amount of time, but have at it. All right, here we go. So I'm actually going to combine all of those and say that what, what dual language learners need the most is interactive, fun activities with other people who speak the, you know, the language. And I'm a firm believer that dual language learners should maintain dual languages because that's an enormous advantage for children to have two languages. We have somehow come to the belief in the United States of America that bilingualism is bad, even though something like two-thirds of the world is bilingual. It's a good thing. And the research that's coming out suggests that when young children do speak two languages, they kind of have to, when they're speaking with someone who, let's say, speaks English, they have to inhibit their use of Spanish. And that inhibition, that ability to control those impulses are exactly what we look at when we look at executive function skills of attention, memory, flexibility, and planning. And those kids turn out to be often better readers and better at problem solving. And when they get to be old, it turns out they're less likely to have Alzheimer's. So being bilingual is a good thing as long as you have enough input in each language. So empower, impoverishing kids in both isn't good, but as long as you're playing and talking and interacting and having conversations. And those conversations, when they're around things like blocks, can be super rich conversations that introduce new words. So let's look at block play specifically. Block play has several opportunities. One is it's a spatial skill and it helps kids learn how to rotate and to build and to put weights in particular ways so they can see the physics of it. And this ability to rotate, navigate, spatially think about the world turns out to have implications for mathematics. After all, when all of you think about counting from 1 to 10, I bet you thought of them in a line. I bet you almost saw a ruler in your head and you could keep on counting and keep walking to the right. All right, so it shows you that the spatial and the mathematics are actually combined in some way. And so, in fact, when you get better at some of these spatial skills, even copying a block design, you will, in fact, be better at later mathematics as well. But it offers another advantage. When you are putting blocks together, you're often saying, put the red block on top of, under, around, through. You're using spatial vocabulary. And that spatial vocabulary also tends to help kids in navigating the world and thinking about later spatial and mathematical skills. The kid who can find the middle or the end or the beginning is using 
relational word knowledge. And it turns out that those relational words that come from understanding spatial things and blocks has everything to do with later STEM preparation. So thank you, Kathy. That was like an, an additional presentation, and I know we all benefit, benefited enormously from it. Thank you. Um, I want to shift back to Shana here. We've had um, a series of questions essentially that amount to uh, participants who are completely sold, they, uh, <laughs> they firmly believe in both free play and guided play. Um, but they have leaders uh, maybe in their schools or in their communities uh, who aren't so sold. And so Shana, thinking back particularly to the principles that you got to interview, um, what do you think would be most persuasive, let's say to an elementary school principal, who just doesn't quite yet see the real value of play for learning. I, I would uh, uh, hearken back to one of our recommendations around uh, principal professional development. So it may not, I mean, you may not have the relationship with your princi principal or center director to kind of change uh, their ideas about what should be going on in the classroom. If you do, uh, if you are able to point them to different research and different tools on how to do that, uh, that that's something that, that, that you could do. But it, it really needs to be uh, systematic, um, and, and you can advocate for more uh, professional development. Uh, specific, specifically regarding uh, early childhood education and child development uh, for principals, principals to, to start uh, working towards. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the places that we discuss in the policy brief is Minneapolis. They're doing um, some interesting things uh, around um, helping principals and child care uh, directors and, uh, talk talk together to kind to, to um, kind of build um, alignment between their uh, teaching methods. Uh, so that's one possibility. But uh, I think uh, advocating for professional development for your school leader or center director um, to learn more about the most up-to-date research on how uh, to incorporate play in the classroom is probably your best best best, best method and uh, way forward. Okay, great. That is very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go into a question. Um, just because we have, we have a little bit of time here. This one's kind of tricky, but um, Kathy, I'm hoping you can offer some clarification. Um, again, this is an amalgamation of questions, but there seems to be maybe a little bit of difference of opinion um, from different audience members in terms of just what is free play, what is guided play, um, and the gray area in between. And some of this then ties back to learning objectives. So one of the questions was more along the lines of um, a child who, during every possible moment for free play, goes right back to the exact same thing over and over and over again. And how could you guide that child toward new experiences? Um, other questions along these lines were asking about timing, how much time should be devoted to free play, how much time should be devoted to guided play. And then there were questions that, um, again, tied back to the learning trajectory and seemed to focus more on, well, how do we fit in guided play, to what extent um, is teacher directed playful activities um, you know with with clear specific learning objectives that are predetermined to what extent is that guided play so I think Kathy I'll, I'll stop there and turn this over to you but there just if you could help um, sort of set out that groundwork a little bit more in terms of helping people think through um, the nuances of this in the classroom setting yeah, and there there really are a lot of nuances. And I wonder, uh, is it cool to go back to the one slide? I just clicked on it. Does that show up for you guys? The initiated direction. There will be a slight delay, but yes, we should all um, see that play conceptualization momentarily. Okay, tell me if we have it. And uh, so let's go back to the definition. 
um, and what we've called uh, playful learning, which includes both free play and guided play. One of the questions was, is it okay if the kid keeps returning to the same old, same old? And I would say, yeah, it kind of is. There's some kids who just like to paint, and they might become the Picassos of the future. There are some kids who just like to do puzzles. I had one of those. And he loved to do puzzles and even upside-down puzzles, and whenever given the chance, he was a puzzle guy. And other people who uh, rotate around more. I mean, it's always great to allow children to get more of the experiences in a classroom, but I sure wouldn't worry about the child who returns to something that he or she has a passion for during free play. Now, what is guided play? Um, guided play is something that you sort of set up the conditions for it. So Montessori toys, if you've ever seen them, the stuff that they have as their activities in the classroom, are a beautiful example of guided play. Well, we set up the toys. We designed those toys. Or like I designed Parkopoly. I designed the puzzle bench. You decide how you're going to play with it. You decide how you're going to go along the steps of the park, uh, the spaces of the Parkopoly game. When the child has agency, joy, when the child is active and engaged, then that's in a guided play environment, even though I hold on to a learning goal and I've prepared the environment with the hopes that the child will stumble into that learning goal. Now, that's very different than my having a learning goal standing in front of the class and push, push, pushing on that vocabulary word that you must learn today, experiment. This is an experiment. What is it? An experiment. When we do things like that, no matter how much fun we have and whatever crazy hats we use, we're really just doing direct instruction, which is initiated by an adult and directed by the adult. And in those cases, the child is more passive rather than active. Finally, you ask the question about timing and learning trajectories. We have found that in many of our studies, children learn just as well, if not better, on the outcome test or perform just as well, if not better, on the outcome test when they have learned it in an active and engaged, meaningful and socially interactive way than they do when they're passive. And the latest research shows that memorization is not how you learn. If you had to remember right now all those vocabulary words that you learned for your SAT test, you probably wouldn't do so well. But the words you really learned because you nestled with them, you cuddled them, you learned them, and you used them, those are the things that follow you into new contexts that we call transfer. Guided play offers that opportunity. Okay, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, slightly different uh, approach here. We have a um, couple questions about branching out into different subject areas. We've had a lot of examples that relate to um, spatial skills and math and science. Um, what about uh, social studies and arts or you know, maybe learning about different cultures? Do you have a few examples, um, particularly you know, research-based examples, where you can talk about how to teach uh, maybe social studies, civics, the arts, through guided play. Yeah, absolutely. And we've done some work on this. And, and in fact, it turns out that doing musical rhythm and drum circles, just doing drum circles, or I don't know if any of you know that game I used to play when I was a kid, Ali, Babin, the 4D Thieves, where you had to figure out who was leading the drum chant. There's a, there's a woman named Megan McClellan, who's a colleague of mine, who's done some beautiful work on this, on these kind of games that teach executive function skills, teach it through rhythm, being able to follow someone else. And, of course, rhythm is just about dividing temporal space, right? That's what makes four beats in a measure or eight beats in a measure. The uh, second thing when you talk about art, what is visual art but actually putting color on spatial layouts. So children are learning how to fill space and use space. And in our own research, we have found that those children who went through classroom experiences that had the visual 
and the uh, performing arts and the, the musical arts, they actually did better on learning to learn tasks. And those learning to learn tasks then were the pieces that formed the foundation for their later math and reading learning. So, you know, we've gotten ourselves bollocked into thinking that if you're going to be a reader, I better teach reading. But it turns out that having a strong ability to communicate with other people and to be social is what builds conversation. And the conversation, often that's engaging in playful experiences and in the arts, is precisely what builds the kind of language skills you're going to use in reading. So again, you have to think broader than the topic area. Think about what's active, engaging, meaningful, and socially interactive. You'll come up with play, and you'll come up with the arts. And they both have links to specific kinds of outcome measures. OK, great. Thank you. So we only have a couple minutes left. Um, but Shana, we had some interest in looking at the um, sort of the, the more positive and play-oriented principles in your research. Can you say just a little bit about the principles who did support play and sort of how they talked about it? Maybe give us a sense of how they would communicate with their colleagues. Or maybe another example um, about how they found that they were able to fit plenty of play in because they understood that play and learning were one and the same. Again, exactly. just a couple I think, of minutes, I, and then we'll wrap up. Thanks. OK, I'll make this quick. Um, but uh, that's exactly right. The principals who understood uh, the research and they understood early childhood education, they were more likely to be play in a positive manner. So we had principals, when, when you become a principal, you're certified from you know, pre-K through uh, grade 12. And so many principals, their teaching experience may have been in middle school or high school. And uh, we talk a little bit about the fact that when they become elementary school um, principals and pre-K is a part of their building or, you know, kindergarten, first, second, and third are part of their building, they don't necessarily always have the experience teaching those grades or understanding, and, but, they're also, but they're doing a lot of the evaluation for those teachers. And so they're directing a lot of what is happening in those classrooms. And so without that knowledge base, uh, I think that is was the, the difference between the principals who really understood play and how it could be incorporated and, and, and you know, knew that play was, was a good thing for children. Uh, that was the difference between, um, between their, uh, I think the difference mostly uh, had to do with their previous experience before becoming uh, elementary school principals, which is why we recommend um, uh, uh, pre-service for, uh, uh, for principals that includes uh, uh, courses on child development and, and understanding of child development as well as uh, early childhood as, as a whole. And so those are that's my short answer for that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That is really extremely helpful. And at this point, I have to say thank you very much to Kathy and to Shana and, of course, to all of the participants today. We have really enjoyed um, learning from our presenters and also developing a deeper understanding from our audience questions. So many thanks to everyone. And um, this webinar will be available on NAEYC's website. So um, that's another way to engage and to share. So again, Thank you all so much, and uh, have a great afternoon.